One of the common surgical procedures done in the United States are hernia repairs. We've also had a lot of requests on what a hernia is and how to describe it. So we're going to use the cadavers today to show us the relevant anatomy regarding hernias. We'll also talk about the differences between men and women and which types of hernias are more common in each gender. So with that being said, let's go take a look at the cadavers. So the first thing we want to talk about is what the definition of a hernia is. Simply a hernia is an organ or a part of an organ that protrudes through the abdominal wall. And there's two types of hernias we want to focus on. One is a ventral hernia, the second is a groin hernia. Ventral hernias tend to affect women more, we'll talk about why. Groin hernias, also subdivided into inguinal hernias and femoral hernias, tend to affect men more, and again, we'll talk about why. Let's start with the ventral hernias. If you take a look at our cadaver here, you can see that we've removed the majority of the skin, which includes the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. You can see some fatty tissue left on the cadaver. But right here, you can see we've really exposed the rectus abdominis muscle, which we call the six-pack muscle most of the time. You can see these little tendinous inscriptions, which are actually separated into its individual blocks. You can also see the right side of the cadaver, we didn't remove this white tissue. This white tissue is just simply called the rectus sheath. It's just a connective tissue sheath that covers up the rectus abdominis just underneath the skin. And on the left side, we removed it so you can see the muscle more clearly. Now, another structure that's really important for our hernia discussion, specifically the ventral hernias, is this structure here called the linea alba. Linea alba just simply translates to white line. Now, the linea alba can be stretched apart or pulled apart or weakened through a couple of different conditions. It can be congenital, but two of the common things that actually pull this thing or stretch it and make it weaker is pregnancy. So a baby growing inside can literally start to stretch apart this line called the linea alba or central obesity, which is a common cause in men to actually stretch this thing apart. They actually call it uh, rectus abdominis diastasis, where this thing starts to stretch apart. And there's plenty of pregnant women that can probably speak to this as it's happened to them in the past. Now, if that thing stretches out, and you can actually see in this particular cadaver, it's a little bit wider than it typically is, this could create a weak spot. Now, this particular cadaver doesn't have a hernia in this region, but many people have had a hernia because of this. And specifically surrounding this structure here that we simply call the belly button, or the umbilicus, you can get a hernia right there because of this weakening or pulling apart of this structure. And we just simply call it an umbilical hernia or a periumbilical hernia. Now if you don't get a hernia there, you can also just simply get it anywhere along the weak spot of this line. And if it's not around the belly button, they change the name and they simply call it an epigastric hernia. Now, hernia repairs are pretty straightforward, we're pretty good at them in the United States, but a lot of the times they use a mesh where they actually go in and insert the mesh and stitch it into the actual connective tissue in the muscle so it can actually stop the abdominal contents from going in. Now we're going to use a different cadaver in a couple of minutes to actually show you specific structures that could actually penetrate or protrude through these holes. But that gives you a general idea, hopefully, of what a ventral hernia is and why it would be more common in women, especially with pregnancy. And especially if it's a smaller woman that has a larger fetus that can really put tension on that linea alba. The next thing we're going to talk about are the groin hernias. Now the groin hernias are a little bit of a fun discussion because we actually have to discuss why they're more common in men. And part of that has to do with the actual descent of the testes. Now we'll be really brief on this, but the testes and the ovaries are actually what we call homologous structures. They came from the same embryonic tissue when you're developing inside mom. Both of them actually start up by the kidneys. But while you're developing in mom, both descend down to the lower area of the hips. On me, you'd see right about here, just medial to your hip bones, or the, what we call the os coxa bone. On the cadaver, it would be generally right in this area. Now, this is a male cadaver, so we'll get into specific structures in a second. But the ovaries are like, we're good, we'll stay right here. Testes get a little bit more adventurous, and they actually push out and herniate to the outside of the body. Now, many of you have seen on people with defined abdominal body walls, in a, that definition or that V, that's created by a ligament called the inguinal ligament. Now on our cadaver, if you look closely, you can actually see how the abdominal wall is kind of folding over, and that's because there's that ligament that's running right in that crease there called the inguinal ligament. And the inguinal ligament connects from this thing called the os coxa, of the anterior superior iliac spine, down to the pubic bone. Now that ligament, there's a canal right above it. 
And that's where the testes actually run through while you're inside mom and herniate out. So there's this natural herniation process and then it pushes into the actual scrotal sac. Now if we take a look at the cadaver, there's some cool anatomy here. While the testes are herniating out, they take structures with it. They literally drag tubes like testicular vessels, the vas deferens, many people have heard of that vasectomy, but vas deferens carries the sperm cells. And this runs into the scrotal sac. Specifically, this structure I'm pulling up with my finger and even the probe over here is called the spermatic cord. And the spermatic cord is that natural process of the herniation coming out. Now that's why men tend to have more problems down in the inguinal region and why they call them inguinal hernias because they're in relationship to that inguinal region or that ligament. And there's more of a weak spot there. Now what's awesome about this particular cadaver is that he actually had an inguinal hernia here. And if you look closely, you can see that bulge right there. Now we haven't cut it open, so we're not specifically sure what exactly it is, but it could be a part of the small bowel or the small intestine or some of the structures that are surrounding that that we'll show in a second. Okay, so we wanted to show you guys a different cadaver here, as you can see. Um, you can see we've got the rectus sheath here. Here's the umbilicus or the belly button. But the reason we're moving over to this cadaver is because we've actually made this incision where we can actually reflect and show you some of the contents that can push through and actually create the hernia. So if I reflect back the rectus abdominis muscle, you can see some of that yellowy tissue underneath this glossy tissue we're mentioning here. And this yellowy tissue is called preperitoneal fat. And sometimes just little pieces of that can push through smaller hernias. The next structure that we want to talk about is this larger structure is called the greater omentum. Now pieces of this could also push through, especially in some of these ventral hernias that we mentioned underneath that would come through the umbilicus or that linea alba. Now if I reflect the greater omentum, you can see the small bowel, which is also known as the small intestine. These tubes or pieces surrounding the tubes, little fatty appendages off the large bowel or just the actual tube itself could push through an opening, especially down in the inguinal region during those inguinal hernias. So one of the big things we want to talk about with hernias is what do you do about them? Now sometimes nothing. Some hernias are asymptomatic, meaning they don't cause any pain. Sometimes people will notice a small bulge around their belly button or even in their groin, and then they'll notice it's reducible, meaning that it'll just slide back into the abdominal cavity and that can be a decision between the person and their physician if they want to actually do a surgical procedure to reinforce the wall with mesh and sutures. The biggest complication and biggest concern for all hernias is if it actually gets incarcerated. Literally like it gets stuck in the actual hole and it can't be pulled back in. That would be an incarcerated hernia. A reducible hernia like I mentioned, you can actually push on it, it will reduce back into the abdominal cavity. Now once a hernia gets incarcerated, it eventually can lead to what's called strangulation. Because of that incarceration or that pinching down on the bowel, it'll eventually put pressure on the blood vessels and the veins, and that can even cause this thing to swell up even more because the veins aren't able to drain the blood out of that incarcerated piece. And eventually that can cause more pain, extreme pain, and it can be a medical emergency where they have to actually do surgery right then and there and actually reinforce it and fix the actual herniation. Okay, hopefully that gave you guys some useful information on the anatomy of hernias. Leave us some comments below or questions or any other videos that you'd like to see in the future. But until then, subscribe and we'll see you next time.